So hi, it's uh, great to be in Berlin again, and uh, I already kind of see the vibrations in the room are quite different to those I'm familiar with in more scientific contexts. Scientific conferences are a little bit more different. So um, that's why I'm dis I decided to make my talk a little bit more different. And um, yeah, just please feel free to ask any questions uh, during your talk. Uh, if you don't understand something or um, so. And uh, yeah, Zonke asked me to introduce you the core underlying technology of blockchain, the distributed ledger technology, and uh, uh, to show you the kind of most popular example of um, blockchain, um, Bitcoin. And uh, I also would like to say something about decentralization, about the transformative impact such a technology has on us as individuals, as uh, organizations, or even on a societal level. So uh, where are we standing right now? Well, sometimes I think uh, with uh, blockchain, we are right now somewhere we were with the internet like 30 years ago. So uh, 30 years ago, almost nobody was thinking that internet will become such a success story. And this is uh, what uh, usually I'm uh, kind of hearing if somebody uh, uh, talks to me about blockchain. And uh, what is actually blockchain? Well, I have a definition for it, and I will introduce it in more detail later. But it, of course, promises to be disruptive technology. And disruptive technology means that you don't have a problem or a use case, and you find a solution to, but you have kind of a technology, and then it is finding a solution. There is a bunch of examples for it, and uh, if you want to uh, hear more on disruptive technology, just let me know, because I was so lucky to spend some time in Boston at Harvard University, where I kind of met uh, Clayton Christensen, who introduced the disruptive innovation theory, so I'm really familiar with it. Okay, so um, probably most of you know blockchain because of uh, Bitcoin, and uh, uh, I will go quickly through this. Uh, and I don't want to speculate about who kind of introduced it and who is actually the guy, Satoshi Nakamoto. But um, from the technological point of view, we had um, distributed databases and even digital currencies long time before uh, Bitcoin or blockchain came into existence. So what was new? This guy, or the organization behind this name, or I don't know, this guy solved two problems. First, he solved the so-called problem of double spending. You could not spend the same digital currency, the same token, twice or more. And second, he introduced incentive mechanisms to participating parties. So why should somebody, why should somebody provide computing and storage power to kind of run this database? And this was the crucial thing. So what is actually blockchain? Blockchain is a, so sorry, I'm a professor, so I kind of like, always like definitions. Uh, blockchain is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer database that consists of a network of computing nodes. And this database stores an immutable, chronologically ordered, and transparent history of transactions and transactions store the information in a chain of block. That's why the name blockchain. And this all is kind of, uh, uh, these this, this nodes, they, they kind of use a very clever consensus mechanism that is based on game theoretical thoughts to negotiate it, what is actually included into the uh, database. And uh, here you see a um, figure on um, how it is done uh, with Bitcoin. So we have some, okay, you don't see it quite well. Um, we have some uh, kind of nodes, and they somehow decide on what is the current state of the database, and if a new block is added, it is always timestamped. So it's chronologically ordered. And these blocks refer to each other. And every block consists of a number of transactions with a timestamp and um, with a um, hash values of 
the previous block and the current block. So I guess everybody's familiar with the hash function, math. Math is really beautiful. And hash function is great. So you can, you, you, if you, if you, you can have any text, any length of um, any string, any letters, any numbers. And with the hash function, you can produce a kind of well and specifically defined length of a string. And then you can make it more kind of um, uh, hard to compute this function if you kind of say, okay, the first numbers of this resulting hash value should have like three O's or so. And uh, I know that Ismail will give a talk um, uh, just uh, um, after my talk, and he will introduce the consensus mechanism more in detail. So I'll skip this. I'll uh, also skip the uh, findings because uh, this is what uh, Ismail will talk about. I want to concentrate on different things. And of course, it uses uh, a public key uh, cryptography. This is also um, kind of a math that um, every transaction consists of the sender, the receiver, the uh, Bitcoin value, the timestamp, and the protocol of the Bitcoin, and it is signed with the public key of the receiver, and the receiver can kind of authenticate uh, himself that the transaction belongs to him. Or otherwise, if somebody's sending the transaction, it is signed with a known private key, so everybody can really authenticate that it is coming from the right person. And here you see uh, everything in one figure. Uh, the figure is quite complicated, but the most complicated figures are actually the best ones, uh, if, somebody, if, if, if you understand them. So first, uh, this is the first step, the green one. It is validated that there is actually uh, a registered sender and receiver. Then it's validated that somebody really has some tokens to kind of uh, transfer them. And if it's validated, if the transaction is validated, it's coming in so-called memory pool, where the transactions are waiting to be stored in a block. And uh, as soon as a new block is created, the block is added to the blockchain and distributed all over the network so all the nodes have the same information. And there is also so-called unspent transactions. So you may have some bitcoins that are not transferred to somebody else and they are uh, uh, also stored in the blockchain in the list of such unspent transactions. So the core idea here is that algorithms rule. <laughs> so that's why we are speaking of the so-called zero trust. That you don't kind of need any persons or organizations you trust to. You trust an algorithm. You trust in math and cryptography. And uh, it's becoming even more interesting with the so-called smart contracts. So if you have processes that are well-defined and that all participating parties agreed on, and these processes are atomic, it means they don't need any human interaction, then they can be automatically executed upon fulfillment of specific conditions. And this is great. This is where the innovation is. So we have a new way to store, to process, and to use information. And you know, for programmers out there, Bitcoin is more, maybe not the best example, but smart contracts can be very, very powerful. So you can, you, can, you, can, you can build loops, and loops make fun for programmers. All the software you know, probably you know, all the software uses loops. So it can be very, very powerful. You can, you can automate any process out there if it does not need any uh, kind of human uh, interaction. So what do we have next? Of course, uh, we have uh, databases, distributed databases, blockchains, and all of them have their advantages and disadvantages. I know that you are all familiar with uh, kind of um, different ways of uh, 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 kind of uh, um, designing a blockchain, but uh, what I wanna say is that uh, Blockchain is actually not a silver bullet, especially if you're thinking of open science, and that's what I actually wanted to talk about today. And I prepared this slide for it. If you have an environment where all parties trust each other, blockchain is probably making no sense. Blockchain 
does not solve the CAP theorem. CAP theorem th says that a distributed database cannot achieve consistency, availability, and partition tolerance at the same time. So it is always a question on trade-offs. Like with the movie Pulp Fiction with Samuel L. Jackson, the life of, is full of trade-offs. And the same is with blockchain. You know, think of security. It is always a trade-off between availability and confidentiality. In blockchain, it is always a trade-off by designing a blockchain, whether you want to have performance or security, whether you want to have anonymity or flexibility. All these design characteristics, what consensus mechanism am I going to use? What about scalability? What about throughput? Guys, even using, so if you decide to go for distributed ledger technology, even using a blockchain is a trade-off. Because in a blockchain, every block has exactly one predecessor block and exactly one successor block. But there is concepts of TLT where blocks may have multiple predecessor blocks or multiple successor blocks or where you don't have blocks at all, where transactions directly refer to each other. So it is not kind of, you know, it is, it is IT. It, it enables us to do something. And that is kind of the core of uh, what I wanted to talk to you ag about, about using this technology for open science. And for me, it's a question of two sides, of system design and uh, of uh, participation. System design. We, researchers, often deal with sensitive data. Think of life sciences, medicine, genetics. This is very personal data. Or think of, I don't know, think of economics or social sciences. It may, people work with sensitive business information. Blockchain, as a distributed database, retains benefits like reducing or having actually no single point of failures and improving availability and integrity of the stored data. So it allows us researchers to store and to protect sensitive data in terms of security and privacy better than ever before. It's not only a question of security, actually, how to keep data secured from unauthorized access. It's also a question of what we call information privacy. What information is stored? Where is this information stored? Who uses this information? For what, what purpose does one use this information? These questions have to be answered. And blockchain may allow us to do so. Why? Because we scientists often rely even on participants who share the information with us. Think of, I don't know, data donors in genetics. With, remember smart contracts? With smart contracts, these data donors are able, are able to determine, to, 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 to decide what of their data is used for what purposes. So if a data donor cares about one disease, cares deeply about only one disease, can decide to share own data with researchers who work on this disease, and none of the donor's data with others. This is what uh, blockchain may enable us. The, um, so it will, it will lead to a higher involvement of uh, research participants. At the same time, blockchain is not designed to store kind of huge data. You know, big data, so I don't know, if I stay with genetics, think of omics data. That's just tens of gigabytes of data. Data size is a real problem with blockchain. Nowadays, we use kind of hybrid approaches. So we, we store data in a cloud, and blockchain allows us to control the access to this data. This is, of course, a step into the right direction but there is still a long way to go. Next, 
we spoke about open science environment. Yes, our research culture nowadays kind of forces us sometimes even to have data silos. We really often have data silos in research. Okay, it has something with uh, uh, things to do with uh, how we are as researchers are evaluated, how do we get our stuff published, how do we get funding and so on. But blockchain may lead to a real open science environment. So in its true in sense, because it is kind of, you know, through this decentralization, it leads to a kind of democratization that the access to research and to research data is kind of getting affordable. So it, is, it will not be probably completely for free, but will be for sure cheaper and easier to um, access. Okay, so, and um, the core thing here is that we have to look beyond the IT value. If we have a new way of store, process, and use information, it can lead to a completely new way of data and process management. And this is something very, very crucial. This helps us to leapfrog to kind of a next de decade of using data and providing data in a scientific environment. And you know, I, I, I introduced my talk, I started my talk with um, the quote of Bill Gates regarding internet. Internet is nowadays criticized and it's criticized for some good reasons. And blockchain promises kind of to solve some of the problems that are criticized right now if people talk about internet. So what I want to point you to is this transformative value of technology. So I actually don't care about technology. I, I love technology, but I don't care what kind of technology it is. If it's blockchain or something else, I don't care as long as it affords me to do something. And transformation is a process. And every process, and every process produces winners and losers. So I think that what we should discuss in this room is how can we take care of this process so that it is run in the right way. And guys, before I conclude my talk, I would like to say that if you want to use blockchain, think of three things. First, if you have a decentralization, if you have kind of distributed nodes, then you can go further. Second, if you have kind of intermediaries or if you have somebody you don't trust to, okay, then think of blockchain. And third, if you have processes that are well-defined, everybody agreed on, and that can be run automatically, also think of blockchain. So if you guys kind of have an idea but don't know how to realize it, realize it, come and talk to me. If you know how to realize it, you could code, but you don't have an idea, come and talk to me. If you have uh, money and you want to do something good in your life and even become more richer, come and talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great talk. And uh, are there questions? You had your two colored blocks and one was participation. You really didn't articulate what that new participation was and what peer-to-peer -peer or blockchain could maybe do that it doesn't do today for science. Oh, sorry, sorry. So with uh, participation, I meant that uh, through blockchain, 
we make, get, uh, get even more data to do research so that participants are encouraged to share their data with us because they know what happens with the data. First and second participation was about the creating a real open science environment that the, it is encouraged to share their own data with others through blockchain because you can get some intensive mechanism for it. So even for people who are kind of sharing their data for research, that's what actually all the blockchain and genomics platform coming from RIES are doing, you actually can get money for it. Okay, what I didn't mention, it raises of course a lot of ethical and regulatory issues. So there, there, there is, that's why I was talking about beyond IT well. It's not only an IT question. But you know, with regulatory, they always need some time. So first we had cars and then we designed, uh, we designed and defined rules how to move them and so on and so on, what is allowed and what not. So they, they always need some time. Uh, that's what I meant with participation. Um, the, re the raw data used in science as well as the science results are big enough to store in blockchain usually. And you just said that we are going to pro store them somewhere else and use blockchain uh, to give access to. But usually where we store, those data are going to be a place which is going to be central uh, authority like Google or Amazon who's going to um, store these in their hard drives somewhere. So how do we ensure that in this workflow uh, the decent pure decentralization happens and then somebody just gets the idea of the data set and the whole blockchain process is out and then we'll just log in and get the data or uh, I'm trying to Get the link. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately I can't predict the future. I wish I could, I can't, so I don't know if you'll be right. But um, yeah, right now we are using hybrid approaches, yes, because you know, if it, these are really huge data sets, they are stored in the cloud. And as I told you before, blockchain kind of um, is giving you control who is allowed to assess this data. So the future research will be for sure about how to make it possible, what kind of designs of a blockchain, of distributed ledger technology, make it possible, always a trade-off, to deal with bigger data sets. And maybe sometime in the future we will have such a setting where even kind of huge data may be stored in, um, in blockchains. Um, you know, it's not always a question of computing and storage power. This is actually not a question. The question is how can all these nodes decide and how can this database be really distributed and stored on different nodes. But we will do this. I don't, I don't, I don't really um, um, kind of uh, worry about this because we guys, we IT guys, will, will, will not only have to do for the uh, next years, but I think we will uh, find some um, answers on these problems, um, to these questions. But, you know, you mentioned kind of these big companies that kind of rule internet. This is the way it goes, you know. They used a niche. So as introduced, as internet was introduced, and internet is not only kind of World Wide Web, internet has more services. It's email, it's FTP, it's voice of IP, name it. Internet was, so let me, let me, let me start different. I, I talked about this yesterday evening. There were countries in Africa that didn't have a functioning banking system for decades because they didn't have a bank on every corner or not such an infrastructure they have in Europe. But with mobile phones and not even smartphones, you know, they, through SMS, they could transfer money. And then they got a functioning system. So internet was not designed for e-commerce stuff or for digital currencies. But this is what disruptive innovations has. But people learned how to use technology for new cases. So with big ones, you know, do you remember a company named Nokia? They were quite small, and then the guys, the guys were very smart. They decided to move on from, I don't know, shoes to refrigerators and from refrigerators to phones. And then it's not so as easy. You know, Apple was also not doing very well for quite a time. And Microsoft was not very popular kind of a decade ago. You know, a decade ago, all my students wanted to go to Google. Nowadays, Google is evil. So it, it changes. I, I, on my own, celebrated ResearchGate couple of years ago. And now it's on the dark side if you're talking about open science. 
So, you know, I don't know what the future will come, but that's what I want to point you to. We, if not we, who should take care of this process, of this transformative process? Because we understand IT, and you guys understand the world outside, so if we connect, I think we, we, we have quite a good chance to do something. Um, <clears throat> Hello. Yeah, I have a question which I think builds very much on what you just said there, because I see the word uh, decentralization in the uh, title talk, which uh, sort of, um, I am always missing the sort of elephant in the room, which is uh, the main property of blockchains, which emerges from that, and that is uh, uncensorability. Because uh, two of the five properties of blockchains are immutability and decentralization, uh, and the emergent property of this is uncensorability, which means blockchains cannot be censored. And uh, this is something which I frequently miss in these kind of discussions. So what about the implications of something being not censorable? Can you speak to that? Well, I can, but it's like, you know, just my thoughts. That's nothing which is... It's a little bit like with the printing press uh, in the Catholic Church, um, because they wanted to censor the printing press and couldn't, yes. and it was of the devil. The, the, so uh, uh, I must be careful if we're speaking about religions. Uh, uh, so you know, uh, if you, if you, if, if actually, if you, if you want to get really, really rich, I wouldn't even go for kind of blockchain stuff. Just to kind of uh, found uh, establish a new religion. That's probably the way to get very rich. Uh, the um, so about decentralization. So for blockchain, as I told you, it's a question of design. So there is also permission blockchains, and they are running quite well. So think of Hyperledger Fabric or so. No? So they, 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 they don't have such problems with throughput or energy efficiency like uh, Bitcoin has. Um, but they are not scalable. So it's always a trade-off. It's always a trade-off. So with the definition of uh, blockchain, as you, decentralization is a core idea, and your point is actually the same as what people speak about yeah. that you reduce intermediaries. That because, you know, this, this kind of... It's a core feature, uncensorability. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation, which you started with Bill Gates. And many times you come across papers and people who say and claim blockchain could be the next generation of internet, in a sense. And um, linking to that point, I would like to hear your perspective. In what ways could blockchain be this sort of second generation, and what could it offer what the, ge what the general internet we're using now is lacking from? So I could speak about this for hours. So, you know, actually, it is not a new internet. We are still using internet technologies. So if, you, if, you, if we kind of have a common sense what internet technologies um, are, that we, we rely on them and blockchain relies on them. But what, what the internet kind of introduced are these big parties that, are, that got big because they had access to data and they kind of store it in a central way. And that's what actually uh, uh, blockchain is about, that this will decentralize it. But of course there will be parties who run who kind of run this database, you know, not only in permission in, in a kind of uh, open blockchain. So for Bitcoin, you know, there is intensive mechanism, but that's not kind of that everybody of us runs a computing node for it. But the core idea is that we kind of move from this internet of information, that's what people are speaking about, to internet of value. That you not only kind of store information, but this information has value. Like in Bitcoin, you know, this, there is kind of this digital currency, but it's not endless, it's a predefined set of Bitcoins available out there. That's why it's getting value, because there is an end. You can't kind of just print more dollars, you know, print more Bitcoins. That's, that's algorithm, you, you, if you trust in it, that, that's, that's what algorithm uh, uh, provides. But with this, under these tokens, you can kind of hide values. And it's not only Bitcoin, so there is kind of, you know, uh, um, um, other uh, ideas, you can even kind of uh, um, give a token a value of your house or something, you know. So there is, there is, there is uh, for, for sure, and that's what I uh, told you, I told you before. There is for sure um, a lot of opportunities and possibilities for us also as researchers to shape the future in uh, the way how we use this information, which is becoming value in the future. 
and uh, we will see what uh, use cases will arise concerning of this. Uh, this for sure a new way, as I told you, a new way to store, to process, and to use information, which is also value. Um, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, fantastic talk. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what you were saying about giving people control of their their own data. For, um, so I, I work in sort of human, uh, like cognitive science, human human research, and one of the issues that we find talking to patients in our, in our research is that, um, you know, th there are concerns about open science, real concerns about open science, because currently if you take part in research, you have to um, consent, right? So you either essentially give consent for your data to be shared, and then it's open, and, you know, anyone can have access to it, or you don't share it at all. So there's this sort of tension between the rights of uh, people taking part in research uh, and, and and open science, and you know if we can find a way to solve that by giving people control of their of their own data, so they can say, I want my data to be used in this, but I don't want it to be used in that because you know I'm concerned about the consequences of it. Or um, I think that could be huge. Yeah, the, 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 the most interesting part is here that if you kind of can control who is able to assess your data, you can change your mind, and you can kind of. You know, you, you, sometimes we don't know what technology will be able to do in 10 years, even with the omics data. So if you right now are okay to share kind of your genome data with somebody, but in five years, you know, oh, this is maybe n something I don't want to have, not only because of me, because of my family, you can change this uh, control. And uh, coming back to the question of data size and the blockchain, uh, there, is, there is research on, you know, there's also, so in, in science, I don't know, in medicine, uh, Zönke is, 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 is a physician, he probably knows best. They are kind of obligated by law and to, to be compliant with uh, all this stuff. They have to store some, you know, pictures and all for 30 years. This is what I mean with open sharing, because, you know, after 30 years, you can, you can, th there is research on that you, this Genesis block, the very first one, that every, is everybody decides on the state of the new Genesis block, because you know, the information after 30 years, you don't need it at all. Then you can kind of uh, um, uh, um, decide, a new kind of, a new, provide a new Genesis block and start from new, and then it reduces data size. And if we speak about open science, I see that there is a lot of cases in here. So it's about data sharing. It's also about how we are evaluating ourselves as researchers, you know, all this age indices and so on. It is also about how to get people participating in science. It is also about publishing and all these publishers and intermediaries. So, and these use cases are quite different because it's, you know, the, the problem, the real problem is always kind of a detail question. So it's, it's quasi, it's, 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 quite, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite easy for me right now to talk on this level, but if we start really to do so and we do it, then it's become complicated. Because then you see a small problem, which is a detailed question we are not thinking right now of. So, and what, the, wh why am I talking about this? It's always a trade-off and it's always a design question. Be before you kind of start building a house, think of how many windows you want to have, where the door should be and so on, how should be the fundament. Please talk to us because we observe a lot of solutions out there that kind of Say we are blockchain, they are not blockchain at all if you take a look, if you take a deeper look, or they are taking the wrong design for the uh, wrong, uh, co for the context. So it is very, very, very uh, uh, tricky here. Be careful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, thanks. We, we're moving on. Uh, so the <laughs>